look at the book of Acts together. Father, we thank you again that we're here. We thank you that we have your word and we ask that by your spirit, you'll help us hear it this day. You'll help us understand it. You'll help us trust it and obey it. Help us be people who live for you. Help me speak what is true now and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, one of the most basic things that I think we understand is <clears throat> what God wants us to be doing in the world is to be telling people about Jesus. That's, that's one of those basic tasks that we have in the Christian life. We talk about it all the time, that we want to see uh, circular head, know Jesus is Lord. We want to, the reason why we, we, we are uh, sending money to people like Morris and Amanda is so they can help see that happen in a place like Cambodia. We, we, we want actually all people everywhere to know the good news of Jesus. But how will this task play out? And will it be something that we can do relatively easily? And, and, and sometimes we might talk about this and say, well, well, if God is blessing it, if God wants us to go and speak to that person, if God wants us to go to that location, then things will go well for us. Now, what we're going to see is something rather interesting as we, we jump back into our series in the book of Acts. Remember, we've kind of done it in two, two parts already. We looked at the, 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 the first handful of chapters like last year. Then in January, we looked at the, 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 that middle section of the gospel going to Samaria. And now we're going to be looking at the, the gospel going to the ends of the earth. And we're seeing what, what's often known as the first missionary journey of the Apostle Paul. And we're going to see something rather interesting because we'll, we'll read, there's, there's, a, there's even actually more verses uh, than I, I, I tried to be somewhat kind to some of you and not give her the entire chapter. She started to read about 40 verses. But there's some verses before it which talk quite clearly that, that God has set apart Paul and, and Barnabas to go on this mission. And yet, what are the results that we hear and what, uh, that we see? Well, we're going to see, first of all, they go to the island of Cyprus and they go to one island and they get one convert. We're then going to see they're going to have suffer from desertion and sickness and expulsion is the outcome of the next part. And so we're going to try and see well, what that might mean for us. Uh, so uh, we're going to jump right in there. Uh, and remember, uh, for those of you who can remember all the way back to sort of, you know, the middle, late last year, we saw that the key verse in the book of Acts is, remember, on the, on the day of Christ's ascension, uh, back to the Father, his, his final words to his disciples is, uh, is to stick around here in Jerusalem because you're going to receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And what's your job? Your job is to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and then to the ends of the earth. And what we saw thus far in the series is, yes, the, you know, we, we saw the Holy Spirit come upon them on, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. We saw them being witnesses uh, over those first uh, sort of six or seven chapters in, the, in Jerusalem. And then after the, the persecution that happens when Stephen's martyred, they, they sort of spread out a bit. The church scatters in Judea. We see Philip in Samaria. And we see that part happening there in chapter 8. And, and to the ends of the earth is beginning to happen. Uh, we saw, of course, in, in, in chapter 10, uh, where Peter has that experience of going and sharing the gospel with the Gentile Cornelius. Uh, in Acts chapter 11, we saw there's a church in Antioch. Uh, and, and, and again, uh, there are Christians there. And so the, the gospel's spreading, but it really hasn't got very far yet at this point in time. Uh, Antioch, Antioch is the one uh, which unfortunately, uh, remember the earth, the, the modern day Antioch uh, was more or less devastated by that earthquake in January. Uh, but that is where the church was first known as Christians. Uh, it was this key location. But in the overall scheme of things, it wasn't that far away from Jerusalem. Uh, basically, my trip yesterday to Longford and back wasn't that much shorter than the trip from Jerusalem to Antioch, right? It's not that far away. Now, admittedly, they didn't have a Subaru to help them get there, but did they have to slow down for roadworks on their trip? I think not. So I think it's pretty much an even as far as the difficulty, degree of difficulty in the trip. So it hadn't really got very far yet. And so what we're now going to see from chapters 13 onwards is the gospel starting to spread out and, and, and then doesn't really get, does it get to the ends of the earth? Well, no, but it gets a lot further out 
than a, than a return trip to Longford uh, in this in this section here. Uh, so, we pick up the story. At the end of chapter 11, uh, we see that Barnabas and Saul, as he's still known then, uh, they are about to go on, a, on basically a mission from Antioch down to Jerusalem to provide gifts uh, for the poor there. In Acts chapter 12, uh, it's a great story. Uh, you can read it later and, and be encouraged by it. It's that story of when um, Peter gets arrested. Uh, of course, we also see another martyr in that story where James, the brother of John, he is killed by Herod, and then Peter is imprisoned, but uh, God miraculously helps Peter escape. And intriguingly, in that story, he, he, when he escapes, he goes to the house of Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark. Remember that guy, because we'll talk about him in a moment. Uh, and then after that, uh, we pick things up uh, in verse 25 of chapter 12. We're told that Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, They returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. And so then we're told they return, the return is back to Antioch, up the coast there. And in the church in Antioch, uh, there were these, these, these church leaders, there were these prophets and teachers, there was Barnabas, there was Simeon called... Uh, I think we're saying Niger, but it's basically the Latin word for someone who is black. So presumably Simeon is actually an African uh, who was there. Uh, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean, who, is, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. And while they were worshipping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said to them, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them. And so after they'd fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on these two men, on Barnabas and Saul, and sent them off. Very clear that God is ordaining what's going on here, isn't it? They are during this time, we took it fasting a few weeks back, didn't we? Uh, But they're during this time of fasting, they're seeking God's will, and God uh, somehow indicates to them that he wants those two men to be sent off on this missionary journey. So what happens? Well, the two of them set sail. They set sail, uh, they're sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, and they go down to Seleucia, so down to the coast from Antioch there, and then they sail to the island of Cyprus. And when they arrived at Salamis, kind of on the east coast, they proclaimed the word of God in the Jewish synagogues, and we're told that John was there with them as their helper. Uh, we don't know what the word helper means. Uh, it's a word that has a very wide range of meaning. It could be a pastoral helper where he's helping with some of the teaching or maybe some of the follow-up that's going on or maybe he's really just there cooking and cleaning and organizing accommodation we don't know but he's there as their helper uh now this map is way too small but for those of you who've got good eyesight or can squint here's just an idea of where we're talking about in the world so jerusalem is down in sort of the bottom right hand corner of the screen antioch the top right corner and so they head off to that island you can surely figure out the island uh, of cyprus And they basically make a journey across the island of Cyprus to the west coast there to Paphos. Uh, And so we're told that basically they travel through the island, they go to Paphos, and there they meet a sorcerer, which is quite an interesting start to the first mission trip. They encounter a Jewish sorcerer, a prophet uh, named Bar-Jesus, uh, the bar bit is important because it wasn't Jesus they met. Jesus wasn't a sorcerer. Uh, anyway, uh, that, that, that he was an attendant of the proconsul Sergius Paulus. The proconsul was an intelligent man. He wanted to hear more from Barnabas and Saul. He wanted to hear the word of God. But Elymas, uh, the sorcerer, because that's what his name meant, he opposed them. He tried to turn the proconsul from the faith. And then Saul, who was also called Paul. Now, we spoke about this way back whenever we were looking at Paul's the Saul-Paul conversion story. This is all the information that Luke gives us about the change of names. When, when Saul goes from being called Saul to being called Paul. He just suddenly says, then Saul, who was called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, the best theory we have is that now he is going to a, a primarily Gentile uh, environment, a primarily Greek-speaking environment, and so he's changing his name to something that makes sense in their context. But that's as much information we have. We're really guessing why he goes from Saul to Paul. Anyway, Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looks at the sorcerer and says, you are a child of the devil and an enemy of everything that's right. You're full of all kinds of deceit and trickery. Will you never stop perverting the right ways of the Lord? Now the hand of the Lord is against you. You're going to be blind for a time, 
not even able to see the light of the sun. Uh, <clears throat> there are those words I didn't have on the screen there. They're interesting that, that, that Saul is basically going to cause this man to be blind, which of course is what happened to him not so long ago. We're told then that immediately uh, mist and darkness came over the man and he groped about seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And then when the proconsul, this guy Sergius Paulus, when the proconsul saw what had happened, he believed, for he was amazed at teaching about the Lord. It's an encouraging finish, but it's one convert on their mission trip thus far. Maybe they had some luck when they were, they, were, they were in Seleucia and they were proclaiming in the synagogues, but Luke doesn't tell us that. So far, the first mission trip has gone from the eastern side of an island to the western side of an island and has helped one person know Christ. Then they face some other issues. Desertion and sickness. This is where the reading began this morning. We're told from Paphos, so from that, that sort of the western part of Cyprus, Paul and his companions sailed to, to Persia in Pamphylia, where John left them to return to Jerusalem. And then from Persia, they went up to, or Perga, it did not make it sound like I'm saying Persia. From Perga, they went on to Poseidon Antioch. Uh, so where are we talking? So they've gone from the western part up to the coast there. And then they, from Perga on the coast, they travelled inland to Antioch, Poseidon Antioch, because you have to say that because, remember we talked about Antioch, that Antioch, there's like 16 of them in the Roman Empire. Why? Because uh, Antiochus IV was this powerful Greek general and his son, who took over from him, wanted to honour dad and call pretty much everywhere he, wanted, he encountered that didn't have a place name or that he felt like he could change the place name, he named it after his dad. It's very sweet, isn't it, to name all these towns after Dad. Uh, but I think there was like 16 or something like that of them. So you've got to kind of identify which one you're talking about. Uh, anyway, that's where they went. And John, well, John travelled back to Jerusalem. Uh, the scriptures don't tell us why John made that journey. Luke is pretty understated, really, in how he describes it. But there could have been all sorts of reasons why at this point in time, he decided, I've had enough of this. Maybe the fact that they had just finished doing an entire island of mission work and had one convert. Maybe he set sail thinking, we're going to change the world. And didn't quite work out that way. Maybe it was because the next part of the journey was to go to Poseidon Antioch. Now, you'll get a map and you're oh yeah, they've just got to go 100 miles or so north. Apparently, they had to go through a mountain range to do that. And apparently, they didn't have a Subaru. Uh, and so... It was an arduous journey, the next part of the step. And so maybe it was that. Maybe there was already some tension. So Barnabas, we're told elsewhere, that actually John Mark was Barnabas' cousin. Yet it already feels like Saul might be taking a bit more of the ascendancy. Maybe that we don't know what's going on, but he gives up. And a little later on, it causes massive tension. Uh, in Acts 15, we'll look at this more in a few weeks' time, but we're told there that Barnabas, uh, on the kind of the next mission trip they wanted to do, Barnabas, well, they reconnected with John Mark, and they're like, Barnabas wants to take his cousin with him, but Paul didn't think it was wise to take him because he had deserted them on the first trip, and had not continued to do the work, and they had such a Barney over it that Barney had a Barney, and they parted company. And so Barnabas went off with his cousin and Paul set sail with Silas and left. And there's this massive conflict and massive division in the church because of this guy, John Mark. Now, John's a really interesting story because like, that's very, a very, very like, massive issue that he basically gave up on a mission trip, then caused conflict between two of the, the apostles uh, but his story arc is rather interesting, to just get slightly distracted by him for a few moments. Uh, because his story arc, we don't quite know how much later on this is, but somewhere near the end of Paul's life, when he writes his letter to Timothy, he says at the end of the letter, only Luke is here with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. We don't know how reconciliation happened, but reconciliation happened so much so that Paul, who had basically had a fight over Mark because he thought he was that hopeless, is now actually saying, can you bring him? Because he's pretty good. 
We don't know what the... We, we haven't got the details and how that happened. But reconciliation happened, which is very worth noting. John Mark's also an interesting character because he, he at some point in time, he decided to try, try his hand at becoming an author. And so he wrote, he wrote a book. Have any of you heard of his book? It's Mark. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. So this guy has quite a story arc, doesn't he? He goes from being the one that pretty hopelessly gave up on the mission trip, maybe for fair enough reasons, causes conflict between two of the church leaders and ends up being the one that wrote one of the Gospels about Jesus. Which again is one of the more convincing reasons why we can trust that the early church, when they said Mark wrote the Gospel, they weren't making it up. Because you're not going to name the Gospel after the deserter. You know, you'd say it was his cousin. As I bashed my, my, my thing off. You would have said Barnabas wrote it or someone more, more prestigious. But they say Mark wrote it. And so I think we can trust that it really was that guy. So they, 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 they have one island, one convert. Then they have a deserter. And then we're told they have sickness. Now, Luke doesn't record this for us. But in Paul's letter to the Galatians, because remember, uh, Pisladi in Antioch is, is in Galatia. And Paul wrote to them, as you know, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. It, the, 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 no one quite knows what the illness was and what was going on. But the best theory is that the reason why they left the coast so quickly is because there was actually some illness, possibly, apparently the region had a lot of malaria. And so they basically tried to escape and find somewhere that Paul would be able to survive for a while. Hence why he ends up in the Galatian region. So the mission trip starts off with basically no success, a deserter, and then the leader of the trip getting so ill they need to go to another region to basically help him recover. Things aren't going so well. And then, well, then they have their first time, they get kicked out. Uh, we find Paul and Barnabas, uh, they travel uh, to Poseidon, Antioch, uh, which... Remember, if you hadn't noticed on the screen there, so that's the place that's inland, uh, up the top of the screen there, in the region of Galatia. Uh, right at the top there is where they travel. And next week, we'll see them travelling across other parts of Galatia there. Uh, anyway, so they travel to Poseidon Antioch. They go to the synagogue. Uh, there was the reading from the law, the reading from the prophets, and then the leaders of the synagogue basically realise they've got visitors there with them, and they are intrigued by these visitors. And they asked them, brothers, if you have a word of exhortation for the people, please speak. And so then Paul stands up and he preaches this rather incredible sermon. Uh, we're not going to go line by line through everything in there because it was, that was basically what you heard Sonia read for us. But it's an incredible sermon that he preaches to this, this Jewish congregation there in the synagogue. He tells them, my fellow Israelites... And also he's acknowledging there might be some Gentiles there who worship God, who have come along to check things out. He tells them to listen. And he says, The God of the people of Israel chose our ancestors and made the people prosper during their stay in Egypt. With mighty power, he led them out of that country. For about 40 years, he endured their conduct in the wilderness, and he overthrew the seven nations in Canaan, giving their land to his people as their inheritance. All this took about 450 years. So he starts off with this history lesson. Have you noticed... Who, uh, whose sermon he sounds awfully like at this point in time? Do you remember another sermon in the book of Acts that starts off this way? Paul was there for it. Stephen's. He's basically riffing from Stephen, the one that, when Stephen finished his sermon, Paul basically had stoned him. Anyway, he continues on. He says, after that, God gave him the judges until the sign of Samuel the prophet. This is all stuff they all know back to front, Right? He gave them Samuel the prophet. Then the people asked for a king and he gave them Saul uh, of the tribe of Benjamin, which uh, from Benjamin there. And then uh, he ruled for 40 years and then God removed Saul and made David their king. And God testified concerning him. I found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. He will do everything I want him to do. Now, after this, what are you then expecting if you're in the congregation that morning? You're expecting to then start talking about Solomon and to go through the time of the kings. But Saul Paul, he basically goes from history of Israel, history of the judges, history of the first two kings, and then boom, 
From this man's descendants, God has brought to Israel the Saviour, Jesus, as he promised. And now he's telling these people, who probably live far enough away, that they haven't heard necessarily what's been going on in, 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 the, in the region of Palestine in the years before that. And he tells them, God's actually brought the one we've been waiting a thousand years for. Before Jesus came, John preached repentance and baptism. And as John was completing his work, he said, Who do you suppose I am? I'm not the one you're looking for. But there's one coming after me whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. That's from Luke 3.16. It's one of those 3.16s that you remember. John, Luke often refers to this scene with John the Baptist. And he tells them, Fellow children of Abraham and you God-fearing Gentiles, it's to us that this message of salvation has been sent. And then he goes on and basically says what's happened to Jesus, doesn't he? He says the people of Jerusalem and their rulers, they didn't recognise Jesus, they didn't realise he is the son of David, been waiting a millennium for. They condemned him. And in doing so, they fulfilled the words of the prophets that are read every Sabbath that you just haven't read. Though they found no proper ground for a death sentence, this is saying to me, Luke often includes these details in the sermons to kind of highlight that Jesus was the innocent one, almost as a defence for the faith as it goes out. Anyway, even though Jesus was, 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 was innocent, they had nothing to condemn him for, they sent him to death and they asked Pilate to have him executed. And when they carried out all that work, when they carried out all that, all that was written about him, they took him down from the cross, they laid him in the tomb, and God raised him from the dead. And for many days he was seen by those who had travelled with him from Galilee to Jerusalem. They are now the witnesses to our people. You want to find out more about it? Go ask all these witnesses, is what he's saying to them. And so we're telling you this good news, this news that God made these promises to our ancestors. He has now done it. He's fulfilled it. It has come. The Messiah has come. Well, how do we know this? Because he raised Jesus from the dead. And then he starts quoting. He quotes from the second psalm, where, where, where the second psalm about the Son of God. You are my son. Today I've become your father. God raised him from the dead so he'll never be subject to decay as God has said, and he quotes from Isaiah here, I'll give you the holy and sure blessings promised to David. And then he says another quote. He can't remember off the top of his head where the quote comes from. But we can tell him because we heard it last week. It's from Psalm 16, verse 10. You will not let your holy one see decay. Now, when David had served God's purpose in his own generation, he fell asleep. David is there, he's still in the tomb. If you guys went and made that trip journey with John Mark back to Jerusalem, you could go and see the tomb. You can see that he's still dead. His body has decayed. David obviously wasn't talking about himself then. But the one whom God raised from the dead did not see decay. And so then he gets to his point. Therefore, my friends, I want you to know that through Jesus the forgiveness of sins is proclaimed to you. Through him, everyone who believes is set free from every sin, a justification you are not able to obtain under the law of Moses. And it's the so what. It's the so what 2,000 years ago, as Paul is preaching in the synagogue of Poseidon and Antioch, it's the so what for us as well. That for us, the message is the same. We can receive the forgiveness of our sins. We can be justified. We can be made right with God just if we had never sinned through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the message that us to believe. That's the message for us to trust in. And I hope that is a message that we have believed and a message that we trust in and a message that we live by. Because there are serious implications if we don't. Because he has a two, kind of a two-pronged approach here, Saul Paul, in his sermon. On one hand, he's saying... Jesus is the one you've been waiting for for a thousand years. He's fulfilled the promises of the scriptures. He is the one who God has risen from the grave. He's the one that if you believe in him, you have the forgiveness of sins. But then he says, take care that what the prophets have said does not happen to you. Habakkuk says, look you scoffers, wonder and perish. For I'm going to do something in your days that you would never believe, even if I if someone had told you. And he seems to be giving them this warning. You better believe this message. Don't scoff at it. Because you will perish if you don't believe this news. That Jesus is the one who can take away our sins. And so the warning is for us as well. I hope 
We have had ample opportunity to trust in this message, but I hope that you personally have trusted in this message that Jesus is the one who rose from the grave and it gives us forgiveness of sins. Because we have had ample opportunity and we must trust in him. Now, the ramification of this is that afterwards, he finishes his sermon, people are going out, they discuss it, they want to know more about it, and so they invite basically Paul back to have another, another chance of speaking to them the following Sabbath day, and then uh, we're told that there's, there's some continuing conversation. It seems like there's maybe some success. Some of the, these people who, who followed Paul and Barnabas, they talked with them and urged them to continue in the grace of God. But then the next Sabbath came and the whole city gathered, almost the whole city. We don't know what Luke means by that, but a whole lot of people gathered to hear the word of the Lord. But then jealousy was stirred up. People didn't like this. They contradicted what Paul was saying. Jesus isn't really the one that rose in the grave. He isn't really the one that we've been hoping in. Who knows what they said, but probably something like that. And they start heaping abuse on him. And Paul and Barnabas basically say, well, we, we had to speak to you. We have spoken to you, but you have rejected this good message. And now we're going to share this good message with these Gentiles here. Because God has made us a light to the Gentiles. And we're told that when they heard it, they were glad and they honoured the Lord. And all who were appointed for eternal life believed. And then there we see that the Lord... Word of the Lord spread, but the Jewish leaders incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city, and they stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. They were kicked out of Poseidon Antioch, and they shook the dust off their feet as a warning and went to Iconium, and the disciples were filled with joy in the Holy Spirit. an interesting start to the first mission trip. We often think it must have been this raving success, must have been incredible things going on, must have been God just doing these miraculous, powerful things. It must have been people converting, converting, converting. Convert. Well, funnily enough, it started off with pretty much no success in the first location. The second location ended up with desertion and sickness. And the third location, well, they got some converts, didn't they? But they were also kicked out of town. And yet... They considered it joy and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And we'll see next week what they then went on to do and how they still continued to share this message. Friends, the message of sharing the gospel is hard. And yet we are to still do it. Uh, there's a story that, that Kent Hughes tells of uh, there was a missions uh, I guess, conference, a rally, if you will, at the Royal Albert Hall uh, in London back in the early part of the 19th century. Uh, and, and there was this clergyman who was there and, and the Duke of Wellington was present. Uh, for those of you who know your history, you know Duke of Wellington, he is, you know, he eventually was the Prime Minister of, of, of Britain. He was the one, of course, who won the Battle of Waterloo. He defeated Napoleon, if, you, if, you, if you're still trying to put the pieces together. He's, a, he's an important dude back then. And one of these clergymen at the mission rally asked the Duke of Wellington what he thought about all this and, 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 and did, he, did he support this mission work that they were trying to endeavour to do. And the Duke asked the, the clergyman, well, he's a military man, so he, what does he say? He says, well, what are your marching orders? And the clergyman said, well, I, the Bible says we're to go to the ends of the earth with the good news of Jesus. And so the Duke of Wellington responded, well then, you have nothing to say about it, do you? You are to obey your orders. And it's a pretty simple summary, isn't it? We don't know what will happen when we open our mouth and declare the good news. Some people will receive it with joy. Some people might want to ask more questions and come back later. And other people might want to kick us out of town. But we still have the same task to go out and share this good news. And to ask that God by his spirit might be convicting and might be changing and might be causing those that he has appointed for eternal life to believe. We don't know who it is that God wants to, 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 to trust in his message. There's this uh, quote from, from, from Charles Spurgeon who talks about that if he knew who these elect were, if he knew 
if, 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 if God managed to, you know, he, I think he describes it as painting like a yellow cross on the backs of everyone that God wants you to tell about Jesus because they're going to believe, then of course you would only go and tell it to those people. But since God hasn't put a yellow cross on people or any other indication, then we tell the gospel to all people everywhere and we see what comes of it. There was some research done many years ago uh, I think it might have been Rick Warren's crew that did it, but I can't remember quite where I read this information. But the, the, the basic stat they came up with is that on average, uh, it, took, it takes about seven invites for someone to actually say, yep, I'm willing to come along to church or I'm willing to come along to your small group or I'm willing to come along to this Christian event that you're trying to run. Seven. In other words, the first six times you talk to them, you're probably going to get rejected. And seven's an average. Some people will respond straight away. Others, it's going to be 15. But it doesn't mean we give up on people, does it? We don't know how God is going to work in people's lives. We don't know what he is going to do. And we don't know what the cost will be. But because Jesus really did rise from the grave, because Jesus is that Messiah so long waited for, because Jesus is the one that gives us the forgiveness of sins, then we have a gospel to proclaim. And we have a town and a region and a state and a nation and a world that needs to know this good news. And so we should count the cost and share this good news and ask that God, by his grace, will help people find life in his son. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for the good news of Jesus. We thank you that we have a gospel to proclaim. And we don't know what will happen when we open our mouth and declare this good news, but, but you do. And you can be trusted. And so we pray that you'll help us be bold, that you'll help us share the good news of Christ, that you'll help us love people and want them to know this, this wonderful life we have in your Son. And we pray that by your spirit you will convict and you will change and you'll help people find life in your son. In his name we pray. Amen.